turn to the Heidelberg Catechism this morning, Lord's Day 45, on page 20 of the Pink Book. Lord's Day 45. Why is prayer necessary for Christians? Because it is the chief part of thankfulness which God requires of us, and also because God will give His grace and Holy Spirit to those only who with sincere desires continually ask them of Him and are thankful for them. What are the requisites of that prayer which is acceptable to God and which He will hear? First, that we from the heart pray to the one true God only, who hath manifested himself in his word. For all things he hath commanded us to ask of him. Secondly, that we rightly and thoroughly know our need and misery, that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of his divine majesty. Thirdly, that we be fully persuaded that he, notwithstanding that we are unworthy of it, will, for the sake of Christ our Lord, certainly hear our prayer, as he has promised us in his word. What hath God commanded us to ask of him? All things necessary for soul and body, which Christ our Lord has comprised in that prayer, he himself has taught us. What are the words of that prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever. Amen. Beloved, we have now reached the final section of the Heidelberg Catechism, the section devoted to the subject of prayer. And just as the disciples of Christ, when they saw his prayer life, were moved to say to him, Lord, teach us to pray, so we ask God, through the teaching of the Heidelberg Catechism, which follows the teaching of Scripture, to teach us how to pray. And we learn how to pray by studying the Lord's prayer. Now that the Lord's Prayer is the only prayer we are permitted to use, we must only use these words. We're not tied simply to these words, but the Lord's Prayer is a pattern for all of our prayers. And the Lord's Prayer is a short and beautiful prayer which really covers everything necessary for us to ask for in our prayers. It consists of an address, our Father, which art in heaven, and then six short petitions, or six short requests, and then a doxology, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, and then a final word, Amen. And we need <clears throat> instruction on prayer, we need to learn how to pray, how to pray because Prayer is the holy activity of the Christian, which all of us find difficult. And that includes the pastor standing before you this morning. All Christians find prayer difficult. All Christians need instruction on what to pray and how to pray. Because, for example, in prayer, we are addressing God. We are addressing the invisible, almighty God of heaven and earth. It's difficult for us to know how are we going to address this God? What words are we going to use? Sometimes when we get upon our knees, words fail us. We don't know where to begin. The Heidelberg Catechism, expounding for us the Lord's Prayer, tells us how we are to pray. And besides, in the church world today, there are many wrong and confusing and conflicting ideas about prayer. Some people think if you pray hard enough and long enough, 
You can manipulate God, especially if you find enough people to come and pray with you. Others say you can change God's mind by your much praying. So we need instruction in light of all of the errors which are found in the church world today. And the Heidelberg Catechism devotes its last eight Lord's Days, so eight Sundays, to the subject of prayer. And Lord's Day 45, which is our focus this morning, is an introductory section on prayer. Then it will go into the six petitions of the Lord's Prayer in some detail, covering also the address at the beginning and the doxology and the Amen at the end. But for now, I will look at, first of all, what prayer is, why it is necessary, and what kind of prayer God will be pleased to hear before we are introduced to the Lord's Prayer in some detail. Let's then consider this morning true Christian prayer. True Christian prayer, notice first it's necessary, then it is reverent, and then finally it is confident. Is it necessary, beloved, to breathe? Would you say that that is something necessary for you? Well, the Bible says that prayer is necessary for the Christian. Prayer is really the Christian's breathing, his spiritual breathing. Prayer is the Christian addressing God. The child of God, the regenerated child of God, calling out to Father in heaven. Now, the Heidelberg Catechism does not define for us prayer. You would expect it would have immediately at the beginning defined what prayer is. It doesn't. It simply says, why is prayer necessary for Christians? But the Westminster Shorter Catechism, that fine catechism held to by solid, faithful Presbyterians, says this, prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God, for things agreeable to his will, in the name of Christ, with confession of our sins and thankful acknowledgement of his mercy. And so we see that prayer is made up of various elements, which is why in the Bible there is not simply one single word for prayer. Prayer is more than simply asking for things. <clears throat> prayer is extolling or praising or adoring God, calling upon Him and saying to Him how glorious He is in all of His virtues, praising Him for His mighty works. Prayer is therefore worship. Prayer is also thanksgiving, ascribing to God the fact that we have so much physical things, we have many physical things, and more importantly, spiritual things. We are saying, when we're praying in this way, it's not because of my skill or industry or wisdom that I have these things. These things, oh God, they come from Thee, and therefore I am thanking Thee for these things. And prayer is confession. Prayer is coming before God and confessing who we are and what we have done, and also confessing who God is and how glorious He is. And finally, prayer is supplication, offering up of our desires to God, what we need for ourselves and what others need. And so you see that prayer is not simply offering up our desires to God. Many people think that's what prayer is, but that's only part of what prayer is. Look at 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. 1 Timothy 2, verse 1. And here Paul is giving instruction to the church concerning prayer. I exhort, therefore, that first of all supplications, 
prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. And then later in the chapter, he especially calls upon the men, verse 8, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Because here the context is not prayer in your closet at home or prayer in your family worship, but prayer in the church. 1 Timothy is about the proper way to behave yourself in the church. And Paul says, important in the church is that men pray. Men called by God pray in the worship services. And look at those words, supplication. Supplication is the activity of a beggar. To supplicate means to beg. To ask for something desperately and urgently. To plead or beg or implore. The next word is simply prayer. It's the most general word in the New Testament, which we say is prayer. That holy activity of the Christian whereby he calls out upon God. And that word prayer refers to something which can only be directed to God. We can beg and supplicate men for something. A beggar can beg another man upon the street to give him alms, for example. But the word prayer can only be directed toward God. We can only pray to God. The next word is intercessions. Now today the word intercessions for us would mean praying for someone else. You intercede for someone. Ask God to bless that other person. That's not what the Greek word means here. Here it refers to that intimacy in prayer. Whereby the child of God can feel free and uninhibited in the presence of his Father who boldly draws unto God and is confident that God will hear him because God is his Father and his friend. And then of course we have giving of thanks, gratitude. And so if someone simply spends all of their prayer time asking for things for himself, his prayer life is, at best, very stunted. We must, therefore, incorporate into our prayers all of these aspects of prayer. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. You've probably heard the acronym ACTS. A-C-T-S. Adoration, confession, thanksgiving, Supplication, a very useful way of remembering the four things that should really be part of prayer. Prayer at its heart is communion and communication and fellowship with God. And prayer really is a deeply covenantal idea, therefore. Remember the covenant. The covenant is not a bargain or an agreement, something coldly hammered out at the agreement table between God and men and human beings. But rather the covenant is a friendship, a bond of sweet, intimately close and blessed fellowship and friendship with God. And that covenant God establishes between his people and himself in Jesus Christ and says to his people, I will be your God and you will be my people. I will bless you. I will be everything to you a God is to his people and you will serve me as my people. And in so doing, God says to his people, you will taste and see that I am good. You will taste and know something of the blessed covenant life of fellowship that I have within my own triune being as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And prayer is the chief part of that covenantal fellowship that we experience here below. In prayer, we commune with God. We communicate with God. He speaks to us through the scriptures. 
and especially through the preaching of those scriptures. We respond to him in prayer. We speak back to him, as it were, in prayer. We pour out our hearts to him through prayer. That's the channel that God has given to us, prayer. And the deeper and richer and closer our friendship is with someone, the better our communication is with that person. And the deeper our fellowship is with God, the closer and more intimate we become with him through prayer. If you have a friend, a friend you love dearly, you want to spend time with that person, you want to speak to that person, you want to unburden your heart to that person, you speak often, frequently, intimately with and to that person. And that's what prayer really is, an offering up of our desires, of our worship, of our thanksgiving to God in heaven. And saying to God, Lord, thou art my friend and my Lord, thou art so great. I love thee, I thank thee, I confess my sins before thee, I seek thee, I need thee. Lord, hear me. That's why the Heidelberg Catechism says that by prayer it is from the heart. Prayer can never be cold or mechanical. A person might get down upon his knees and utter a few words, but if his heart was not in it, it was not really prayer. It was simply going through the motions. Because prayer must always be an expression of the new life which we have in Jesus Christ. Our hearts are overflowing with joy and thanksgiving to God. Our hearts sometimes are breaking with sorrow and we call out upon God, Lord, hear my prayer. And sometimes all we can do is sob or sigh. And no words really come out and there's no thing we can really say to put our thoughts into words. But God still hears that kind of prayer. And so the Christian does pray. He must pray. Prayer is his breathing. Prayer is his communication and communion with God. And if our prayer life becomes neglected, we become weak. We become distant from God. We don't have that close fellowship with God that we really desire and which we really need. And we have a kind of malady or disease, something like spiritual pneumonia. Someone who cannot breathe properly and freely. And that's a serious spiritual disease. Prayer, therefore, is our spiritual breath. And the Heidelberg Catechism says in question answer 116 that we must have sincere desires. And that word in the original German means hearty sighings or sighings from the heart. It's something intimate. It's something from the heart. And the Heidelberg Catechism tells us that prayer is necessary for two reasons. First, God requires it. That's why it's necessary. God requires it. God requires that we show thanksgiving to him, and God requires that we do that in the way of prayer. God says to us, the chief way in which you are to show thanksgiving to me is by prayer. Now from a certain perspective, of course, thanksgiving is something spontaneous with the Christian. It flows naturally out of the Christian's heart. But from another perspective, prayer is something which must be learned. Thanksgiving, in particular, is something which must be learned and practiced by the Christian. 
Lord's Day 24, way back many weeks ago, question and answer 64 taught us, it is impossible that those who are implanted into Jesus Christ by a true faith should not bring forth fruits of thankfulness. And one of those fruits of thankfulness, indeed the chief of those fruits of thankfulness, is prayer. Therefore, it is impossible that the Christian should not pray. But we are children. Even the oldest person here this morning is spiritually a child. We're all simply little children. We have a certain understanding of things, some more than others, perhaps. But like little children who are given something nice by someone, we have to be taught to say thank you. A relative comes into the house and gives to a little child a toy or a piece of chocolate or whatever, and the child most often will run away in the corner and play with it or eat it, as the case may be, and the parents have to say to the child, Johnny, what do you say to Aunt so-and-so? You have to coax them to say, thank you. And perhaps at the beginning, it's dragged out of them. They don't really mean it in their heart, but they learn. They learn to say thank you, and they learn to mean it when they say thank you as well. And as we grow in our understanding as little children about our own sins and miseries, and about what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, we learn and we practice thanksgiving. We grow more deeply in our thanksgiving, and we express that thanksgiving more sincerely and more ardently in our prayer. And add to that the weakness, even the perverseness of our sinful flesh. Our sinful flesh does not want to say thank you. Our sinful flesh does not want us to pray. Our sinful flesh rebels every time we try to get down upon our knees because by nature, beloved, we are proud, we are perverse, and that's what makes for us prayer to be a struggle. And so God requires of us thanksgiving. And the chief part of this thankfulness is prayer. How are we to show our thanksgiving? We are to get down upon our knees and we are to call upon God and we are to use the words, Lord, I thank thee, or something similar. That's the chief part of thankfulness. Thankfulness which flows from a heart overwhelmed with thanksgiving because of the mercy and grace and love of God and that thankfulness must be channeled into prayer. Prayer which is an expression of true faith. Prayer which comes from the heart of a child. Prayer which cannot be manufactured or faked. Prayer offered only to God. Second, God will not give us what we need, and that is the grace and Holy Spirit. Question, answer 116. God will not give us that, His grace and Holy Spirit, except we pray. He will not automatically as it were, give us a pill which will take away all of our troubles. He will have us pray. He will have us pray for what we truly need, His grace and His Holy Spirit. Now, of course, we already have His grace and His Holy Spirit as Christians. As children of God, we have those things. But we need, because of our own sins, because of the constant struggle we experience in this world, we need a constant renewal, a constant supply 
of grace. And so we come to the overflowing fountain of all grace and mercy, and we come, as it were, empty, and we say to the Lord, Give me more grace, Lord. Fill me anew with thy Holy Spirit, so that I might be able to do that which thou dost call me in this world to do. You probably heard about the sinner's prayer, where an unregenerate person is called to pray unto Jesus, to ask Jesus to come into his life and to save him. Well, the sinner's prayer is not possible. An unregenerate person cannot pray such a prayer, because only one who already has the grace and Holy Spirit of God is able to pray. When someone is praying that prayer, really, they are, as it were, too late. If they truly desire that Jesus Christ be their Savior, if they truly desire to be submitted to Him, He is already in their heart. He has already come. He has already saved them. He has already given them life. So that from that new life they cry unto God in prayer. Because prayer is the evidence of life. Just as when a baby cries, a newborn baby cries, you know that is evidence of life. For when any baby of any age cries, or any adult even, he speaks or cries, you know that is a sign of life. The life of Jesus Christ within us produces prayer. An unbeliever is dead in trespasses and sins. An unbeliever, therefore, is not able to pray. But the life of Jesus Christ within us must be maintained and promoted and strengthened by fresh supplies of God's grace and the Holy Spirit, and those things come only in the way of prayer. Only come to those men and women and young people and children who ask for those things. And so God says to us, Ask of me, and I will give unto thee my grace and my Holy Spirit. And God says to us in James chapter 4, verse 2, Ye have not, because ye ask not. That is why Calvinists pray. There's nothing mechanical or automatic about salvation. Calvinists pray. Some have said Calvinists cannot pray because Calvinists believe in the sovereignty of God that all things are already ordained and therefore that rules our prayer. Why pray for the conversion of other people if God has already decided what's going to happen? But that is a foolish objection because God's sovereignty includes all of the means which he will use to reach the end. God sovereignly determines to save the elect. And as we will see this evening, God willing, He does that through the worldwide preaching of the gospel and in no other way. And God promises to give unto His people grace and the Holy Spirit to preserve them even unto the end of their lives in Jesus Christ. And He does that through the means of prayer and the preaching and other means as well. But not without prayer. These blessings of salvation, the Holy Spirit and the grace of God are given to us, are promised to us in God's eternal decree. They have been purchased for us on the cross, but we will only receive them, says God, in the way of our praying for them. I notice the kind of person who receives these things. They ask, says answer 116, they ask with sincere desires. 
That is, as I said before, with sighs from the heart. They really mean it when they ask for it. They don't ask for it in a hypocritical manner. They really desire these things. Secondly, they ask continually. That is to say, without ceasing, without let up. And those who ask thoroughly are thankful for them. Sincerely asking, asking continually, and asking and being thankful for them. Those are the kinds of people to whom God will give his grace and Holy Spirit. And God says to us in James 4 verse 3, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. God desires that we ask for grace. God desires that we experience our salvation. Not that we are spiritually asleep throughout the entire process of salvation, but that we experience it. And that we express our deep dependence upon God every day in the way of our praying to him as the fountain of all blessings and the source of every good thing. And some of these truths are beautifully expressed in Psalm 65. Notice what Psalm 65 teaches us about prayer. Notice first of all those who pray. Who is the one who comes into the presence of God in his temple and prays to him. Verse 4, Blessed is the man who thou chooses. The elect, they pray. The reprobate, they never pray. The elect seek after God and find him. The reprobate never do. They are far off from him. The elect desire to worship God. The reprobate never desire to worship God. They cannot pray, they will not pray, they never pray. And the elect pray as part of and in fellowship with the church. In Zion, verse 1, Praise waiteth for thee, O God, in Zion. And the elect pray, understanding their sin and their misery and their weakness, their flesh. Verse 2. Iniquities prevail against them. Verse 3. And they like pray and experience God's gracious answer to them. The goodness of God's house dwelling in God's courts. And notice too that wonderful title that is given to God in verse 2. O thou that hearest pray. That's the title that Jehovah God, the one true God who reveals himself in his word, that is the title of the one true God. O thou that hearest pray. And of no other God can that truly be said. Baal did not hear prayer. Cast your mind back to Mount Carmel. Elijah, the one prophet of the Lord, and 400 prophets of Baal. And the prophets of Baal did their utmost to attract the attention of their God, jumping up and down upon the sacrifice, calling for hours upon end at the top of their voices, cutting themselves and causing their blood to flow upon the top of the altar. And Baal did not hear, because Baal does not exist. Baal does not have ears to hear. Allah, the God of the Muslims, does not hear prayer either. All of the millions of gods of the Hindu religion, none of them hear any prayers from their blind 
pretended followers. The God of unbelieving Judaism, the one worshipped by the Jews in Jerusalem and throughout the world, who is not the true triune God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He does not hear prayer either, and nor does Buddha hear prayer. Only Jehovah, only the true God of heaven and earth, he hears prayer. O thou that hearest prayer. That's what is celebrated in this psalm. God hears prayer. And the force of the Hebrew grammar is, O thou that continually and ceaselessly and always hearest prayer. O thou whose ear is always attentive to the cries of thy wretched, miserable people here below. Thou art the God who hears prayer. And thou answerest, thou answerest with the forgiveness of sins. Verse 3. Thou answerest by calling us to dwell in the fellowship of thy courts and in thy house. Thou satisfiest us with the goodness of thy house. And that word satisfy means thou fillest up to the brim. We are satiated, the word is. We are fulfilled. We are stuffed, you could say, after a meal. When you've stuffed yourself, we're stuffed with the goodness of thy house. That's God, the true God, who answers and hears prayer. We must remember that this communication with God, this fellowship with God, is with God, with the almighty, unchangeable, glorious, sovereign God of heaven and earth. And therefore, all flippancy, all overly familiar pally language is inappropriate because we are approaching the courts of the living God. We need to approach him with a holy awe because of who he is. And that's the idea in verse 1 of Psalm 65. Praise waiteth for thee O God in Zion. That phrase is somewhat difficult to translate literally. Literally it says, To thee, silence, praise God in Zion. And that word silence, which is translated here, wait, means silent, reverential, even awestruck expectation. The idea is that God's people are waiting in silence, hushed silence, holy silence and reverence before God. Think of Habakkuk 2 verse 20. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Or Revelation 8 verse 1. When he that is Jesus Christ opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. There's a hushed expectancy at the temple, therefore, as they contemplate the glory and majesty of this God. There's no heedless rushing into the courts of God, because God is glorious. There should be an awestruck, hushed, reverential silence before we open our mouths in prayer to God. Don't simply blunder into the presence of God. Pause. Consider who it is that you are going to speak to. Be awestruck. Think about what you are going to say about the one before whom you are going to appear. And remember sometimes, as verse 5 tells us, sometimes his answers to prayer will be terrible. By terrible things and righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our <clears throat> salvation. Terrible things 
means awesome, awe-inspiring, frightening things. Sometimes God's answers to our prayers are not what we expect. They cause holy fear in us. And look at the rest of the psalm. It tells us about God's wonderful works. He sets fast the mountains of his strength, verse 6. He stills the noise of the seas, verse 7. He makes distant peoples to be afraid of at his tokens, verse 8. And the rest of the psalm tells us about God's marvelous provision for his people and for his creation. And so the Heidelberg Catechism says about, about us that we should humble ourselves deeply in the presence of his divine majesty. That's the approach that we should have when we pray unto this God. He is a king. He dwells in courts. He is not there for your body or your pal. You enter into his presence with a certain amount of holy trembling. That's prayer. That's reverent prayer. So there's a reason in God why our prayer must be reverent, but there are also reasons in ourselves why we must have this deep humility before God. First, we know our weaknesses, our desperate plight, our need. That we rightly and thoroughly know our need, says the Catechism. And so we see here the great contrast. On the one hand, we have God who has no needs. God who is the infinite fountain of all good. He does not need us. He does not need our prayers. He is not really up in heaven wondering what he shall do until someone might pray to him to give him something to listen to. He doesn't need our prayers. But we need to pray to him. Because we are terribly needy before him. We are desperately in need. And only in so far as we understand our need will we pray. If we do not really believe that we are needy, we will not pray. If we think we have no need of the grace of God and the Holy Spirit of Christ, to give us the strength required to do our calling in this world, we will not pray if we think we have strength of ourselves to be Christians, to fight manfully against sin, to be good husbands and good fathers, to be good wives and mothers, to be obedient children and young people. If we think that as office bearers we can do it all in our own strength, we will not pray. We will very rarely pray. But if we realize that we are empty vessels who always need to come to the fountain to be filled, and then we go back and we use up all of those resources and we come back again to be refilled, and again and again and again we come back. Then we'll pray. We'll always pray. We'll pray without ceasing. We'll pray fervently. And the more we understand our need, the more urgently we will pray. The German word for need here means emergency. Our emergencies. We deeply understand and thoroughly understand our emergencies. An emergency is, for example, when someone has a heart attack. He's going to die if he doesn't call emergency services. He doesn't say, oh, I'm having a heart attack. Maybe I'll call an ambul ambulance later when I have some free time. No, he calls an ambulance immediately. And when we understand our need, we call upon the name of God urgently, even without going through the formality of closing our eyes and getting down upon our knees, we will call upon God silently, perhaps in the car, Lord, help me. It's an emergency. Lord, 
I need thy grace and Holy Spirit. I can't go on without it. We understand that we are but flesh. That's what Psalm 65 says. O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. And flesh in the Bible is a symbol of the weakness and frailty of man. God is spirit. God is holy and powerful. Almighty. And what are we? Flesh. Poor, weak, flesh. Flesh and blood. And we come into the presence of the King of Kings. Groveling in the dust is a fitting posture for flesh and blood when it comes into the presence of the King of Kings. And so verse 3 says, Iniquities prevail against me. They are too strong for me. That means they prevail against me. They are mighty against me. Too mighty for me to cope with. These are literally words or things of iniquity. Either they are his own sins or they are accusations and attacks by iniquitous men against him. Whatever it means, they are too strong for him. The attacks of the wicked upon him are too great for him to cope with. His own sins are too heavy for him to bear. And so he calls upon God, the one who hears prayer. And God says to him that he will purge away his sins. And that brings us to the second reason. Our misery, our need, our emergency, but also our misery. That we might thoroughly and rightly know our need and misery so that we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of His Divine Majesty. And that explains to why prayer is treated at this point in the Catechism. First we see our misery, way back at the beginning of the Catechism. Then we see God's deliverance of us, covered from Lord's Day 5 all the way to 31. And then, we see the law again, which shows us again in misery, but more importantly, tells us how to be thankful to God. When we have seen how miserable we are, and how we are saved in the blood of Christ, we come to God, confessing our misery. We come like the publican, beating upon our breast and crying, God have mercy upon me, a sinner. If you know your sin, if I know my sin, then we will come in prayer to God. Do we know our sin? Do we know the guilt of our sin? Do we know the terrible debt which we owe to the justice of God? And do we pray therefore, Pardon our transgressions, O Lord. Lift away the burden of my guilt. Take away from me the obligation to pay what I owe, because it has been laid upon the shoulders of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Do we know the terrible pollution of our sin? That sin which defiles even our best acts when we're trying to keep the commandments of God in gratitude to Him, and we find that our prayers, our good works, anything we do is defiled and polluted by our sinful flesh. We cry out unto God, As for my transgressions, God, purge them away, cover them in the blood of Jesus Christ. Do we know the enslaving power of sin which has such a grip upon us? Do we know what the psalmist says, iniquities prevail against me. My sin is so strong in my life. It prevails against me. I fight against it. I try to avoid it. And yet it prevails against me. Purge my sin away, Lord. Give me thy Holy Spirit and thy grace that I might fight against my sin. 
And have we seen, as we saw last week, the perfection demanded in the law of God? And do we cry out, Lord, I only have a small beginning of the new obedience. Increase it in me. Give me thy grace and thy Holy Spirit. Help me to be more obedient that I might have a bigger beginning in this obedience. Give me what I need, O oh Father. I'm miserable. I don't deserve it. I come humbly, deeply humbled into thy presence. And that's the kind of prayer, beloved, that God hears. A prayer which acknowledges need and misery. A prayer which comes from a heart thoroughly humbled before God. God will not hear the prayer of a Pharisee. God, I am a sinner. He will not hear the prayer of a Pharisee who says, I thank thee that I am not as other men are. He hears the prayer of the publican. I have terrible needs. I have urgent emergency needs. I am in misery, O God. Hear me and receive me. But prayer too, necessary as it is, as necessary as breathing, brought to God in humility and brokenness of heart and deep reverence before him, but also prayer is confident. The one who prays is confident that he is heard. We pray to him who is called thy that hearest pray. Thy that hearest my prayer. Thy that hearest our prayer as the church of Jesus Christ, as the New Testament Zion. Because prayer, remember, is an expression of childlike trust and confidence. We're praying to our Father, which art in heaven. We're praying to Jehovah God, the God of the covenant, the God who is faithful to his covenant promises. And nothing is more contrary to prayer than doubt. One who prays must believe that God is, that he exists. It's mockery for an atheist to pray. It's mockery for someone to pray in unbelief. Not only that God is, but that God hears prayer and that God hears our prayer. It's mockery to pray to God and yet believe in your heart that your prayer gets no higher than the ceiling. That's mockery. That's unbelief. We must not say that. Prayer always comes from a heart of faith, from one who believes that God is, that God is, as Hebrews 11 puts it, the rewarder of them which diligently seek Him. One who comes believing that God has promised to give certain blessings to his children. And one who believes that God, when he promises, always delivers. And so the Heidelberg Catechism and Psalm 65 together, they brim over with confidence. Notice that in the Heidelberg Catechism, we who pray are fully persuaded, fully persuaded that he will hear us. We who pray before believe that God will certainly hear our prayers and we claim his promises. And again we have it in Psalm 65. Thou that hearest prayer, yes, God of our salvation. Verse 5. The confidence of all the ends of the earth. And that word confidence means the object of trust of all the ends of the earth. And if the psalmist who lived in the days of types and shadows 
could say, O God of our salvation and the confidence of all the earth, how much more can we not say such things in confidence? But our confidence in being heard is not in ourselves. Of ourselves we are unworthy and have no right to come into the presence of God. Our confidence, our right to enter God's courts in prayer has been given to us by Jesus Christ. Christ makes us able to pray. Christ gives us the right to be heard by God. That's why our prayers end with the words, for Jesus' sake, or in the name of Jesus Christ. Not because we believe that they are magical words that open the key to heaven, simply by saying then that God will give us something that we want, but because those words mean something. We are saying, Father, God in heaven, because of who Jesus Christ is and because of what he has done for us poor sinners, hear us. We don't expect the Father to be heard because of who we are, because we are miserable, wretched sinners in ourselves. Thou hast the right to slam the door in our face if we come without Jesus Christ. But hear us because of what Christ has done for us. God will hear only those sinners who are forgiven, whose sins have been blotted out, who are justified and righteous before him because of the work of Jesus Christ. And that is why we cannot take part in ecumenical or interfaith prayer, because such prayers are not made in the name of Jesus Christ. There will be a presidential inauguration soon, I presume. And most likely, the president will invite members of all kinds of religions to come to that event. What kind of prayer will be offered at such an occasion? Most likely, it will be a general, non-specific, PC, politically correct, inclusive <coughs> prayer. One which will not offend the Muslims, or the Hindus, or the Buddhists, or the unbelieving Jews. And therefore, one which will not end with the words, for Christ's sake, or in Jesus' name. How could you have a prayer with, for Christ's sake, if Muslims and unbelieving Jews are there? That would offend them. But think of the offense it causes God when sinners who do not believe in Jesus Christ gather themselves together and dare to offer a prayer in the name of someone other than Jesus Christ, dare to pray to him, and in so doing, bypass Jesus Christ. God will not hear such a prayer in mercy. God will be angered by such a prayer. And add to that, that Roman Catholic prayers, which might actually have the words for Jesus' sake on them, they don't believe that Jesus Christ has secured salvation for his people. They believe that the work of Christ continues in the Mass. They believe that the work of Christ is helped through the intercession of Mary and the saints. And whether they use the words in Jesus' name or not is really irrelevant. We cannot enter into a prayer with them either. Our prayers must always come in the name of Jesus. And by that we mean because of the finished and perfect work of Jesus Christ, Lord, hear us. Only on that basis, hear us. And we know 
But for the sake of Jesus Christ, God will certainly hear our prayer. God gives us access into his presence through Jesus Christ. Christ brings us into the courts. Christ assures us a welcome in God's house. By Christ, we are adopted as children of God and we have the right to address God as our Father. Christ assures us that we will be satisfied with the goodness of God's house. And if we doubt that, we look to the cross. Will God hear us? Look to the cross. If God gave Jesus Christ to that death, on the cross. If God give us his only begotten Son, shall he not with him freely give us all things? Yes, in the way of prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee again that we may approach unto thee. We dare not take this privilege for granted. We confess we use it so seldom, we neglect it, we ask the Lord that thou wilt stir us up, stir up the embers of our cold hearts, as it were, and cause us to pray unto thee fervently and often and from the heart. Receive us for the sake of Jesus Christ, for he alone is our acceptance with thee, for Christ's sake. Amen.